Salutations! Welcome to another episode of Ruby Review, where I review the Ruby episodes. Sounds simple, no? My name is Mookies, and I'm so glad you're here. Sorry I haven't been doing them weekly as I planned to, as depression got the better of me, but now it's week one of the six-week hiatus, so I might as well catch up on the last four episodes I missed. Lots to say, let's dive right in and see what fresh-faced fuckery this week has in store for us. I continue to like Robin. She's just fun when she's not tossing chairs about. <laughs> I really like the relationship between Kuro and Robin. It's like she's the positive, big, little sister he never had, the one that couldn't be found in Raven. It feels like they're kind of a found family, or at least I like to think so. And her name, continuing the theme of birds related to the Bronwyns like Crow and Raven, is just really nifty, and I like it a whole lot. Robin was right to apologize, and Crow is right that it's also his fault. This is what you get when you team up with the serial killer who tried to kill you numbnuts. This is probably the stupidest decision made by a character in the show, and I still detest it. What I hate about this scene is that Crow blames himself, only to blame Clover. Like, all three of them, Robin included, were dumb as hell. But you mean to tell me he's gonna pin it on Clover? Not gonna fly in my book, sorry. I do feel bad that he's lost the one person whom he felt he could be around. One whose semblance was a mirror opposite of his, that allowed him to accompany and befriend Crow without being in danger. That's kind of sad, and it's definitely part of the reason I'm mad as fuck still about Volume 7's ending, despite Volume 7 being my second favorite volume after Volume 3. Believe it or not, I know a little of what that's like. When people are worried you're gonna sniff out their secrets, they tend to push you away. It makes a real connection... difficult. Robin, those are not remotely the same. Like, your semblance is under your control, even if people don't like the consequences of your semblance. I understand people are reticent to make bonds with you because they're afraid of her finding out the secrets. But her semblance is, again, completely voluntary, and she can't force them to hold hands with her and speak and verify what they're saying. Crows is always active. How does his aura survive that? And it brings him genuine misfortune. If you're a notebook, he's the death note. You are not remotely similar. Harriet is the fucking worst character in recent volumes. I think I hate her more than I hate Caroline Cordovan, and I possibly even more than the Albane fuckers and Team Cardinal. She is so aggravating, and so annoying, and so entitled, and so rude, and so belligerent. I hate her. There is perhaps only one character I hate more than her, and he pops up later in this volume. I love how Robin stood up to Harriet for Crow. And, asked, and offered her an airtight way to know what happened and prove that Harriet is just being a dick for the sake of it. She's not afraid of Harriet, and I love when two hot-headed characters or two characters who are both bold and self-assured come to an impasse or one has to defend someone from the other. I love that so much and eat it right on up. Fuck Harriet for shoving Beth Boy Marrow too. Arrogant asshole. I can't believe I liked her for most of Volume 7. I like how John launched Ren into the air. It was cute. I was wondering why Ren didn't just send his Stormflower Blade into the Rocky Mountainside or something to anchor him and the Hound, but I guess wrapping around a heavy mini boulder works too. Despite how creepy they are, and how disgusting things with segmented bodies and dozens of legs are, I actually kind of like the Sentinel Grim. It's definitely one of my favorites. Also, wow, it did call for backup, and that's something that continues to convey its intelligence and how fascinatingly different it is from normal Grim. The song is bitching as always. God, they they really don't miss, do they? Okay, no way is that sword holding the weight of all of them. No fucking way. I call it shenanigans. Brandishing a weapon against your quite literally defenseless little brother is kind of fucked up, Weiss. Also, Whitley was offering to help. At least it sounded like it. And all Weiss did was dismiss him to his room. Seems like a wasted opportunity to me for Whitley to be another person who can help. Not sure how or what he'd do, but whatever. I really like how Ren is allowed to have a dissenting opinion instead of being a wallflower who keeps his thoughts to himself. It's nice to see it's nice to see characters engage with each other in conflict, because conflict drives the plot and furthers their character development. I agree with Yang here. Like they clearly did a lot of things that huntsmen are supposed to do, and it doesn't matter that they didn't have official li huntsman licenses. Also, didn't they get their official huntsman licenses back in Volume 7 anyways? They're literally huntsmen. It doesn't matter what he's saying. What is he going on about? Ren demeaning the work that they did do makes no sense to me. 
So what if they lost a lamp? That doesn't just count the fact that they managed to do all those huntsman-like things. I kind of understand Ren's position here too, because it's clear he doesn't want to be in charge and doesn't want to make the tough calls. He thinks Ironwood is the only one who is capable of that, despite everything Team Ruby has done, and he's bottling up his emotions because every time he expresses them, the universe punishes him, like when he was kissing Nora and lowered his guard only to have Tyrion slaughter so many innocents, and when he hesitated against Neo, who looked like Nora, and ruined his chance at getting the lamp back. Dude can't, just can't catch a break. Ren, I you cheated your way into bacon. This is something I've been criticizing for years now. But they did it. They finally did it. They addressed the John snuck his way into Beacon plot point from Volume 1. I had lost all hope they'd addressed it, especially since it's been 7 years and 7 volumes since then, and Beacon had fallen back in Volume 3, and John had never seemed to face any consequences. He's not even really facing consequences now, though Ren did just throw that back in his face to humiliate him. John has rarely if ever faced consequences for his choices and decisions, and though I really wish he was taken to task back in the Beacon era, I'm glad I'm going to take this as a sign that they haven't forgotten gotten, and other stuff that seems dismissed is fair game to bring back up again. Haha, <laughs> fair game. Telling someone not to panic just tells them there's something to be panicking about, and it's never gonna end well. You can clearly hear the sounds of children giggling and Salem's conjured smoke apparition of her and Ozma's daughters. I'm glad she hasn't forgotten about her children, and hopefully they'll address their deaths at some point. Him baby. Aaron Dismook? Aaron Dismook? Dismook. I think. Okay, Aaron Dismook does an excellent job at diversifying the voices of characters he's portraying. He's got one for Oscar, one for Oscar possessed by Ozpin, and, and now it's clearly and now it's clear to tell that this is Oscar impersonating Ozpin. Do you know how hard that is to pull off? Major kudos to him for that talented voice work. Those few seconds where the smile melted off Salem's face and she stared intensely at Oscar before snatching his face were really intense. I loved it. I love how Salem is pragmatic. She recognizes that when Oscar tells her he doesn't know about the beacon relic, she doesn't just beat him and insist he's lying. She recognizes the unlikelihood of Oscar knowing and acts accordingly, switching tactics. It's just nice to see that she's intelligent and about her business, as opposed to just being someone who brutalizes Oscars for funsies. Ooh, okay, maybe I should take that back. Ouchies, that looks like it hurt. Maybe just a little bit. I love how vibrant and colorful the magic is. I really enjoyed it back in Volume 6, Chapter 3, The Lost Fable, which was Salem's backstory, and Ozma's backstory as well, I guess. And the backstory of Remnant in entirely, but okay. Um, but to see it in action, and much more intensely, is a beautiful moment. If Oscar wasn't getting hurt, I mean, but you get the idea. Also, that screaming, holy fucking shit! Those dry, racking sobs, that was uncomfortable to listen to. Why is Oscar getting his ass beat so badly this volume? He's taking so much abuse, it's ridiculous. One of you is going to tell me what you know. I don't much care if it is you or Ozma. Either way, I'll finally have the relic. I won't tell you anything. The hmm is the hmm of a bitch who knows just how wrong you are and is gonna enjoy watching you get absolutely obliterated. I laugh every fucking time I hear it. She really said, is that so? With such a simple sound. I love it. Great work, Jen Taylor. This show really loves beating up this little brown boy who's the darkest of the main cast, might I add. That's all I have to say about that. Hazel continues to have one of the worst motivations in the entire series. What is that? That's what is that? That's gonna be you if that grim arm successfully takes over Cinder. I really really hope it doesn't come to pass because again I've mentioned multiple times Cinder is one of my favorite characters. That really quick look back at Cinder that Salem did here as she walked by is a tiny bit of animation that I absolutely adore. It conveys a lot of personality and whoever did that, thank you so much. I love how quickly Neo goes from surprised to unimpressed whenever some crazy fuck shit happens. She's in the domain of the most wicked character in the entirety of the world, staring at an abomination concocted by said wicked character, and all Neo does is look disinterested and convey her complete lack of fear or intimidation with her facial expressions. I love it. Yes. Yes, of course. Without you, I am nothing. Sinner keeps saying that, so it's clearly a thing. I wonder who instilled that obedience into her, that mantra of being nothing without someone. I sense a treasure backstory as hinted at the beginning of Volume 8, and I can't wait to learn more. Cinder really seems to be a glutton for punishment, or has a death wish. She was just told explicitly not to do the thing, and all Cinder seems to understand is do the thing. 
If Salem finds out, Cinder is going to go through hell, I just know it. The walking animation of Cinder is perfect, and Neo's little floaty, dainty steps thing was really fun touch too. Emerald finally getting some screen time, and getting to team up with Neo, who also has the illusions-based semblance, as well as Cinder, whom she clearly loves and would die for. I just hope the last part doesn't come to pass. Miles Luna does a really good job voice acting, and he knows how to diversify his voice as well, it's really impressive. I'm impressed with how he's matured as a voice actor. I kind of don't like this down and out voice John seems to have a lot lately, where it's just soft whisper kind of tone. But I mean, like, it's the end of the world, so I can understand why he needs to look and sound glum. Also, sweet, sweet martial arts content. Despite being on the same team, I don't think we've seen much of John and Ren interacting. It's we need to talk. <laughs> Ren, I'm just gonna come out and say it. You are one of my best friends. These past few months, I feel like we've really bonded, even though you don't say much. I mean, you're really quiet. To be perfectly honest, I don't know that much about you personally, but darn it, I consider you to be the brother I never had! And I, you. Even though it was way back in Volume 2 when John said this, I still think it really does apply. More moments like this can change that perception. The lack of interaction between Team Juniper is what led to Pyrrha's death feeling kind of hollow because Pyrrha and Nora barely interacted, Pyrrha and Ren barely interacted, Ren and Jean barely interacted, Nora and John barely interacted. Like, it, it, you know what I mean. We need more of them interacting, barring Pyrrha because she's dead, of course, but. Holding out hope, maybe she comes back. Some delusional hope, who cares? Um, this is a nice scene where Yang comforts John and he recognizes that Ren was just lashing out and didn't mean it. Plus, Ren revealing John snuck his way into Beacon and it was the first time that Yang has heard about it, but by now he's absolutely earned his place as a huntsman. Okay, clearly this is some Bumblebee content as she's obviously talking about Blake, but I'm with John in that I understood her to mean Ruby. That little twist is kind of weird though. Why would Blake think less of Yang for? being on the ground and helping people. Isn't that what they do? It's such an odd moment, and I don't know why she would ask that, as well as only about Blake. But I swear if this is another moment that they tease Bumblebee, but they don't do the thing or they bury the gaze, I'm quitting the show for good. I really don't like the whisper hush tone John's speaking in. Can he please go back to his normal voice? Like again, I understand why he's stressed and tired and not exactly peppy, but it just annoys me for some reason. Bitch, what the fuck is that? And that's the end. Lots happen and I can't wait to see what happens next. I'm particularly invested in the Salem Oscar scene and how Hazel Oscar will proceed. Though I'd have to say as a resident Cinder stan that I'm most interested in what Cinder and her gaggle of bad bitches are going to be up to. Cinder vs Penny round 2? Let's go! Thanks for tuning in and see you in the next video. Until then, take care friend!